line or a village, but stand as examples of sacrifices, uh, examples of pioneers that paved the way for us to be. And I would also like to acknowledge the presence of teachers who are on this call, former students who are on this call, and the entire village. And lastly, I want to acknowledge and recognize the future, those who will come and be, uh, be uh, the recipients of the legacy that we leave behind. Again, my name is Kamal Patel. I'm here in Harlem, New York City, born in the Bronx, New York, raised in Westchester in a village called Greenberg, and uh, have traveled through uh, out my journey uh, to identify and clean what we know as uh, manhood. And I'll start off by saying in the conversation, because it was centered around this idea of manhood, it is something that we all have to recognize is earned. And through formal experiences and trials that we overcome and obstacles, it takes on the, uh, the road of us becoming, right? And so some of the critical ways that we become is first and foremost, before you get to manhood, there's a, a healthy sense of boyhood, right? And what your narrative represents as you are uh, going through your younger years. And many of the students that are here, whether you're in uh, high school or middle school, you have some informal experiences that are helping to usher you into the man that you are envisioning. There's a saying by hip hop artist, Immortal Technique, he says, the purpose of life is a life with a purpose, right? And so first and foremost, we are all born with a divine design of identifying and claiming and living our purpose. And we go through that experience through trials. And some of those trials are very uncomfortable very, and very discomforting. Right, so I stand before you with uh, a voice today, being able to articulate a vision and a mission and a purpose. But there was a time where I didn't have the words or the confidence to be able to communicate in the way that I am today. And so uh, I had ideas that where my words just would not be able to capture some of the meaning of what that was. And so it was a very enduring passage I went through in order to cultivate a voice. And so I start with that. And I want to speak to this idea as known as a uh, rites of passage or initiation. And those are really significant in terms of being able to establish uh, a, a manhood path and a manhood direction. Right. And that's really important for all of us on the call who represent a community because there's no way I can identify myself as a man, as an individual, if a community doesn't affirm that. And as the community members that are on this call, it's really important to establish the platform and the ambiance and the environment where you can call uh, into existence what you're seeing in a developing young person, right? You, you, we are at a point where we have to be able to recognize certain things that a young person has no idea that exists within them. And so that's a part of the experience about designing experiences that are there to challenge, charge, and affirm a, a young person, right? And so some of those critical points and questions, they're very simple in terms of your becoming, but at the same time, they are uh, very profound. So the first question that you know has gone back since antiquity and can be seen on the ancient walls is, know thyself. So who am I, right? Who am I? Who am I connected to as a, a, a relationship to a divine power? Who am I in terms of my people's narrative, right? Who, who are my people? What were their contributions? What gifts do they bring to the world, right? So who am I? Whose am I? What's my mission? That's a driving force question that all of us have to at some point identify else we begun to meander and in the world and the society that we live in you better believe for a young man of color uh, of people in power who know your divine potential they have an agenda because the greatest declaration to uh, the, the, the greatest op opposition to uh, 
the supremacy of, of white people or the white power structure is black manhood or manhood. So that the whole notion of manhood is something that uh, is very critical for us to examine and, and develop a path towards because there is a path when you do not have one in, in, in place. All right, so who am I, whose am I, what's my mission? How will I get there? What are the steps that I need to take once I start to develop an understanding of who it is that I am and some of the talents and gifts that I have? What are my gifts? How do I use my gifts? And what legacy will I leave behind in the sands of time? Right? And so these are some of the critical questions that you know, I'm, I'm posing that are questions that you begin to grapple with. If you don't have the words to be able to define them, find images, find music, find art that is able to best reflect and, and allow you to be able to connect to something that is greater than, than yourself. And that's something that is gonna resonate so deep. And once we are able to identify that and claim that, then we start to move towards a direction of manhood. And my last point is that is that is constantly unfolding. That is not uh, necessarily a destination. It truly is a journey. There will be different chapters and stages and phases of your life. Even when you think that you've arrived there, there will be something that activates another intelligence in you and another sensibility in you that will push you uh, beyond that. Right. So I'll wrap up for now. And uh, I'll take a look into the chat and maybe come back in to, to the conversation. Thank you, Brother Patak. Um, and so I, I guess I'm going to go down the list. Next up, I have Dr. Malik Small, who, again, I've known for uh, quite some time. Um, I will allow him to give you some background on who he is and what he does and how he came to be. So go ahead, Dr. Good afternoon. Uh, How's everybody? Uh, thank you, Dr. Stitt. I want to say hello first to you and to uh, my fellow panelists. I also want to give a big shout out uh, to my OSG family. What's up, Moody and Akbar Cook and Dr. Riley, uh, Dr. Leslie uh, Thomas. And I want to say hello to all of our guests. Uh, I'm Dr. Malachi Andrew Small. I'm a middle school principal in East New York, Brooklyn. Um, for the better part of a, a decade, and prior to that, I uh, was a middle, uh, charter school director. Uh, but first and foremost, because we're discussing identity, right? I'm a child of God, number one. I'm an African, uh, number two. I'm a, a son, a father, a brother, an uncle, uh, all which are significant um, pieces of who I am and who I am as a man. Um, when I look at the title of this presentation, Identity, manhood serving our community. And I'm, I'm quite sure it was intentional, uh, Dr. Stitt, that you put identity first and then manhood, then serving our community, um, because we can't serve our community unless we understand our role as men. And when we say our role as men, that's juxtaposed uh, to that complementary uh, role as partners to our women, right? And then first and foremost, we can't even do that unless we're clear on identity. And I think um, when we look at the work that needs to be done, when we look at what's going on in our communities now, when we look at all the, the beautiful people out here um, just demanding and fighting and asking for change, right? And they're looking for political change, so looking for economic empowerment. I don't think that you can have political change or economic uh, empowerment and development as a people unless you first examine identity. Who are we as a people? Even though we come from uh, different spaces and places throughout the diaspora, um, whether it is from Africa, or whether uh, we're looking at our indigenous brothers and sisters, again, if we don't examine first who we are as a people and what the cultural glue is that holds us together, everything that we're doing will be for naught because you can't look for political power if you haven't first established the glue and the ties that bind us culturally in terms of who, in terms of what our identity is. So I think it's a very powerful uh, kind of undertaking to look at, at identity, then manhood, then serving our community. And so when I speak in a, a lot of places and spaces and forums, one of, and particularly as an educator, one of the things that I'm very passionate about is ensuring that we have culturally responsive 
uh, instruction in our schools because our babies cannot grow. It's like looking at a beautiful tree, but not recognizing the beauty of that tree and the strength of that tree comes from its roots. And so we have our, our, our children are almost like blades of grass blowing in the wind because they're not rooted because we haven't given them their roots, right? And their roots are our culture, our history, and having them be strong and understand who they are as relates to the rest of the world because they're very strong in what their own identity is. And so again, as we continue to embark in these uh, many uh, battles and just recognizing that the battles are, uh, are right now being fought on many fronts. They're being fought in the street, they're being fought in the legislator, legislature, they're being fought in the judiciary, they're being fought uh, in the spaces and places where policy happens. Again, as we move forward and continue uh, this mighty fight that we're engaged in, again, if we're not rooted in identity, if we don't understand that our brother from the Dominican Republic is as much an African as our brother from Jamaica, as our brother from the continent, if, they don't, if we're not clear on that, if we're not clear on who we are as African Americans and understand that our history didn't begin nor did it end with slavery, but slavery was an interruption in our mighty march, our mighty walk. It was an interruption. And not only was it an interruption, it wasn't, we weren't at any point in time passive in that experience. It was always an experience that's defined by resistance. And if we don't understand that as we look in the mirror to understand who we are, and as we look to educate our children, then again, there'll still be a, a huge kind of disjointment uh, if we don't proceed with context. And at the end of the day, every person who is successful is successful because they're able to marry and, and, and have a context that's defined by politics, economics, and culture. And so being able to, to contextualize the fight, to contextualize the conversation, and understand that you can't be successful in one area without being successful in each of those three areas, uh, then, then we're going to continue to kind of move on the hamster wheel. So again, uh, good afternoon. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Dr. Small. And next up, we have Mr. Frank Patanella, who is um, with the ACLU down here in, um, in Maryland. Uh, and if you could just add, you know, your introduction, how you got here, you know, all that, that wonderful stuff, we would appreciate it. I got here because you asked me to come here, so <laughs> I got here, um, which I'm always happy to do. Um, my name is Frank Patanella. Um, I'm a Baltimore native. I'm born and raised here. My parents um, were immigrants. Father is from um, Sicily. <clears throat> I learned um, a lot recently about um, the gen genetic makeup of um, you know his roots and having um, some. Uh, uh, genetic tests and, and all, um, found out that I have some relatives that were Northern African from his side. That was a new thing for me. Uh, my mom is from Thailand, uh, from Bangkok, Thailand, and that kind of gives me this look of, I don't know, most people think I'm, I'm Latino. Um, from Mexico, Puerto Rican, Central America, South America, I get it all the time. Um, and I, you know, that's really, you know, uh, just growing up in Baltimore, it's mostly a black and white town. And just, you know, other people's perception of me and how they spoke to me, how they interacted with me, the kind of questions that they asked, you know, where are you from? Um, you know, that all have, has shaped my identity over the years. Um, and I think that you know, I, I became an activist because I grew up in Baltimore City and I was always just intrigued about what I saw. Um, you know, why were black neighborhoods in Baltimore um, so blighted? You know, where did, why, why are the houses vacant? Um, why is there poverty at this level? Um, where does the violence come from? Um, it was always something that was a question in my head and I wanted to learn. As the older, as I grew up, I wanted to learn more and more about that. So I started reading a lot. I started talking to a lot of people. Oh, then I started getting a sense. So wow, this is, the, 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 the roots of this really 
dates back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. And, you know, even after slavery, um, things like redlining, blockbusting, uh, Jim Crow laws, the impact of these policies are lasting. And even in today's policy that, um, you know, we see emerge, um, developed outside of community, um, is a form of, of white supremacy, right? And these are also policies that um, perpetuate the structural racism that we see today. So, um, you know, I got to the HCLU 12 years ago. Um, I'm an education advocate. Um, our work is rooted in um, a lawsuit, Bradford versus the State Board of Education, which um, challenges uh, the state on um, adequate funding for uh, schools and school buildings. Um, but as I got more into the work, I'm very much interested in pushing uh, culturally re uh, responsive pedagogy. I think a comprehensive framework for anti-racism is needed in Maryland schools, particularly in Baltimore City and districts that have a lot of um, immigrant students. Um, it's a very important to identity development <coughs> in which uh, students um, themselves are developing and um, developing a positive sense of identity. And currently the curriculum, um, the way that um, teachers, um, maybe not all of them, but in general, the way teachers interact with students, um, it, could it could be really perpetuate perpetuating the damage that is also prevalent um, in the outside world. world. You know, the messages um, that students are hearing about um, their own race, their communities, um, the devaluation of them as human beings. Um, schools have to be a place where intentional comprehensive anti-racism happens. So, okay. Well, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Frank. It was oh. going in and out, so I, I wasn't sure. I apologize. Yeah, the last thing I want to say is that um, in my work, I just wanted to make sure that um, I, I, I communicate that we believe um, that we need to help communities build up their own institutions, their own structural power. This is not something that I think the ACLU um, should lead or, um, you know, um, maintain our power within our silo. Um, and affect change. I believe change has to come from the community. So my commitment is always working with community groups to uplift, uplift their voices, um, make sure they understand the political process, um, how decisions are made, um, helping them with strategies in, in, in affecting change. Okay. Wow, that was a lot, especially when you're talking about uh, community and community building. So I appreciate that. Thank you for offering that perspective. Um, and welcome again, Frank. Um, next up, we have uh, Mr. Mays, are you on? I can't see. I have like three screens open right now, so forgive me. Mr. Mays, are you here? Okay, well, I'm gonna uh, move on and um, introduce Mr. George Ford, who is a special educator in um, Baltimore County Schools. And if you could just share um, your, Mr. Ford, you're muted. So if you could just share your, um, a little bit about who you are and um, how you got here, uh, we would appreciate it. You're muted. Okay, I might have to come back to you because I want to keep um, the momentum flowing uh, and stick to the um, the topics and the activities that we have. Um, so, hello, 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 hello. Okay, well, um, you had an opportunity to uh, get to be introduced to to three of um hey can you hear me i'm sorry who who that's mr mays mr mays i'm can you hear me 
I can hear you. We hear a lot of uh, background information. Yeah, uh, I'm in a, in, a, in a noisy area right now. Uh, I just wanted to say, I, you know, I really appreciate everybody, you know, what's going on and everything like that. that um, uh, I was recommended by my principal um, to, to speak. Um, and I think that, you know, this is something, that, a forum that it needs to be spoken about um, and just to bring awareness to what's going on in the world right now. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited for the questions. Um, okay, well, I, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Mr. Mays. Um, so let me ask you a question. What, yes, what does manhood mean to you? Or what does it represent to you? And then I'm gonna post the question in the chat box for, um, for my scholars as well. Okay. Um, I believe as, as far as manhood, just the, the certain things that we got to take care of as far as our community, our uh, building up as a family, um, uh, taking care of our responsibilities and things that is necessary for us to hold down as, as, as men. Um, we have so many challenges as black men that fall under our, uh, our, our, our path that we, we, need to, we, need to take, we need to take control of but we have to have the understanding for it. And if we don't have an understanding for it, then we're not going to be successful men because there's so many things that we lack behind. And I think as young men, we need to follow behind the positivity that, you know, older men are leading for us. So as, as a man of my days, uh, I, as a young man, um, being a young man in the school system, um, there's a lot of things that I see, there's a lot of things I'm exposed to. Um, and I, I try to expose young men to those things because we, Young men need to see, you know, it's a hard, it's a hard task, but we need to really uh, take heed to what's what's going on right now, and find ways to maneuver through it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Did you? How are you making out? You okay? No. All right. Well, we got a little uh, tip for Mr. Ford. Click on the three dots in the upper right hand corner of your name in your screen. Do you see where it says mute or unmute? All right. While we're waiting for Mr. Ford, I'm going to um, pose this question to to um, to the community. Um, who is Malcolm X? Because, and let me preface this. I, I'm a personal, uh, I guess you would say, uh, not a groupie, but Malcolm X is one of my personal heroes. He is iconic to me. Um, and as, you know, even though, I'll go step back for a minute, even though this, this symposium is for our young men of color, I am not only um, a black female educator, but I'm also a mother. I'm also an auntie. I'm also, you know, uh, a mentor. So I have uh, various roles that kind of force me into this, um, this whole arena as far as addressing in, um, the needs of our young men because they tend to be the ones that are underserved and underrepresented um, and always marginalized for some strange reason. So when, um, and I'll just shout out Brother Pata real quick, when Brother Pata and I worked together on... Um, a proposal for all male high school in the Bronx a uh, number of years ago. Um, it was that, that, that event, that catalyst, it was the catalyst in, in the work that I've, I've done. So it's a reason why um, he, I've, you know, kind of put this whole event together, not just because I'm a black educator, but because I'm a black mother, I'm a black auntie, I'm a black sister. Um, and I need to be able to meet the needs of, of our young men. So, um, the question that I have is, who is Malcolm X? Um, and Malcolm X to me is my, someone that I idolized because I just thought he represented um, black manhood for so many various reasons. Um, and yes, he went through transition just like everyone else. I mean, we, we're all here and put on this, this earth to walk a, a specific path. And sometimes we go off path from time to time and that's expected and um, it's accepted. But when you have, when you, then gain your focus and your purpose, which I feel Malcolm did. Um, he knew that his purpose was to protect his people, to educate his people. Um, and, and I think that has been a driving force in the work that I have done and how I connect to him. So if you wouldn't um, mind sharing, I see educate 
has said that Malcolm X is an African-American writer and speaker that reflected on black liberation during the 1960s. Yes, he definitely was. Um, Mr. Ford, I see you, manhood to me means developing a self-worth in a world that focuses on lessening your confidence as a black man. That's kind of heavy. Um, I wish you had your microphone off so I could- Can you hear me now? Now we have you, yes, yes. Okay. Could you speak a little bit to that, if you wouldn't mind? Um, as far as, I'm, I'm getting feedback here. So you might hear my voice, tw I'm hearing my voice twice. Okay, we have you on, a, because yeah, you have two different devices that you're using? No, just one. Okay, I'm not too sure what's going on, but can anyone else, if you use the chat box, can anyone else um, hear Mr. Ford with a back? Yeah. Okay. You can you hear me? You. Okay. Um, you just think? to speak on what I felt was manhood, what that meant to me is as a child, we are learning from our immediate community how we can act and what we're supposed to do. And I'm sure as it is today with young black men, they, and I've known that um, adults, my daughter, she's an adult and she has a son. She has to talk to him about what he should and what he should not do when confronted in the white world. Well, this is a stress for young men because they limit them automatically. They have to think about what they have to say. They have to think about what they have to do. These things are stressful in young black men as it was when I was growing up and it still exists today with young men. They have to be taught how to um, let's say, adopt to the white world. This is a hard thing for the young black men to do. I want to talk about how they can, as individual black men, how you can serve your community. Understand who's in your community. Understand how you can learn from your mistakes in your community. These are the ways that you will mature. Don't regret mistakes. Learn from these mistakes. I took a couple of notes here. Um, understanding your community. Uh, let's see. I, my community is the community I serve in school. It's also the community where I live. And there are two different communities because in school, I find in this community something that's missing. And one of the things I find that's missing and that I try to correct is that lack of understanding between parents and the school system, especially for young men of color. So I make it my business to be able to make connections with parents, call parents, visit homes. Some things these are like old school in respect to teachers going into the neighborhood and understanding what the child is going through. But these things can be accomplished if adults, especially educators, take the position of going in and visiting the community, not just talking in school and in the classroom, but making connections with parents. So making connections with the parents is how I serve my community, my educational community. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Um, I know that, you know, everybody actually had an opportunity to speak to the three main um, topics that I wanted to, you know, cover in this, this meeting. And um, I posed the question to the scholars who are, who are here. How does your identity affect your relationships with your teachers? Because Mr. Ford touched on it. Um, Brother Malik Small touched on it. Um, Frank... Patanella spoke on it, culturally responsive education. And to all my educators out, out there, I know you, you know, we're all aware of it, but is it happening in the schools? Are, are our young men connecting? Do they have healthy relationships with their teachers, with their, any faculty member? I, I, and I know, um, you know, we, we tend to do this in the culture. You know, you have to know everybody from the secretary to the, the custodial staff. It, you know, we're, 
we used to have a family. Our school was a family and our relationships were built on just that. And um, so I'm posing the questions to all my scholars. You know, when your teachers, when your teachers see you, do do they see you as a person, or do they see you as who you represent? Okay. So if anybody wants to respond to that in the chat box, that's fine. I, I definitely wanted to say something about that. I would okay. Who? That's Mr. Mays. Mr. Mays. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Mays. Um, I think as a young black male being in a position that I'm in in the school system, um, certain teachers can't handle that because of like, I'm in an upper upper role, almost, as you want to say. Um, whereas though I can dictate the relationship between the teacher and the, and the student, um, I think a lot, of, a lot of teachers have missed their opportunities. And I like to call it the golden opportunity where if there's a kid in crisis or a kid struggling, that they miss that opportunity to, to build that relationship with their kids. Um, a lot of times um, I'm called for those 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 relationship moments and I'm here to fix the situation. Um, I think that as a young man, as myself, um, we need to like really take heave and try to address the situation at hand and try to build with the teachers, but also with the students as well, so that there's a, there's a comfortable relationship between both of them. Um, it's kind of sad that in the school that I work in that certain certain staff members miss those moments and it becomes harder it makes my job a little harder but it makes my my relationship stronger with the students um there, there's things that uh i know mr ford can contest to because of how everything works out in the school in our school um that we are able to do certain things that other staff members are not able to do um and i hope that he piggybacks off of it but um i think that just being in the position that I'm in, I think as a, as, a, as a young black male being in the position that I'm in, again, we need to learn how to, to work with the staff members, but also build with the staff members to help these situations because they are lagging in them. There are a lot of things that staff members are missing, especially for men of color, young kids that are, are struggling. Um, and we need to really, really, truly work with these, these staff members because these staff members are missing their opportunity to build with the kids. Absolutely, absolutely. Mr. Ford, you wanted to chime in? You wanted to, to piggyback and share? Uh, yes, definitely. I, I see it. I have 45 years of experience in education. It started in New York. And what I've seen in these 45 years has not changed at all. How uh, When we go into the educational field as black men or women, our role seems to be lessened. Either they feel that we are catering to the kids, um, they don't understand the needs of our children as we do, and because we understand that, because we've had that experience, we can relate to what the child is going through. As much as I've tried to bridge that understanding with uh, my white co my, co my Caucasian coworkers, it's almost as if they can't believe that they don't understand what these kids are about. Um, I've been said, it's been said to me that they think I spoiled the kids, but I know from my own experience as growing up as a black young youth that I was needy. I needed things uh, that I wasn't getting from um, my immediate community, my family, my uh, neighborhood, we have always been put down. So as I work with Mr. Mays in the school that I'm in, I'm constantly trying to help other educators understand the black youth, the female, the male, and it's a challenging situation. Thank you, Mr. Ford. Um, I know brother, uh, Dr. Malik Small had his hands up. And so would you like to, to add something to it? Yeah, I'm gonna add uh, several things. First of all, I was in a conversation yesterday with some other principals, superintendent, and someone had mentioned, and I heard it uh, here also, about the system being broken, right? Mm -hmm. The system is not broken. The system is actually working well. It's doing exactly what it was intended to do, right? And so again, it goes back to the whole idea of uh, systemic racism, right? The education system was designed 
not to educate our children, but it was designed to school our children, to school them and socialize them out of their own selves, right? And so it comes back to the whole notion uh, of identity. I heard Brother Ford mention something uh, about code switching, right? It's okay to code switch. And I'll say, uh, like Senator Jamal T. Bailey says, it's okay to code switch. It's not okay to soul switch. Mm. And so when we think about the whole idea of manhood, again, you can't think about manhood without thinking about identity because as black men, and again, I'm a black man, I'm not a, a man of color. Um, and, you know, I do take a bit of offense that every time someone else comes up with a new term to define me, I have to buy into that term. Right. I'm a black man, always right. been one, always will be one, right? And so again, because I understand that, because I understand what it means to be a black man, that it roots me. So again, when we think about manhood, um, we think about our young men, right? We have to understand that we can't raise men playing by somebody else's rules. We can't raise men using a, a Eurocentric ideology of domination, death, and destruction and think that our men will come back and serve our communities and be great husbands and great fathers, so forth and so on. At the end of the day, we have our own uh, kind of ideology. And so again, when we think about um, historically our own ideology, whether it is looking at a system of uh, Ma'at, right, that says that, that we need to be rooted in truth and justice, harmony, balance, order, reciprocity, and propriety, right? If we're not acculturating our young men into ideologies that historically uh, have worked for us, then we're destroying our young men. It's the same thing in the school system. Again, school system works perfect. It was meant to destroy our children. Mm. We actually have to break it. It ain't broken. We need to break it in order to, to raise men and in, ensure that they're gonna be dynamic and strong. When we look at Malcolm X, we, you, you can't look at Malcolm X without looking at him in, its, in his entirety, right? What's dynamic about Malcolm X is not what he became. What's dynamic is looking at the fact that his parents were Garveyites, right? When he went to the school that wasn't broken and his teacher told him, you'll never amount to anything, right? That destroyed him for some period of time. We got to look at his journey through the streets and through prison and look at it as a journey of self-discovery and a journey of growth and a journey of dynamic change. That's really the secret to really teaching our young men about Malcolm because many of our young men are Malcolm in his early stages. Tupac was Malcolm in his early stages, right? And so we have to look at Malcolm's life and not just look at Malcolm and, and who he became. And then you'll understand who our children are and who they can be. Right. And so all of these things become very important. System ain't broken. System is working perfectly. We got to break it and we yeah. got to create a system that works for us. And at the, again, in order to raise men, you got to understand we're not just raising men. We're raising black men. We're raising uh, Latino men. We're raising men uh, uh, who are the children of indigenous people around the world. And you have to understand historically what that means and look at who and what it is that our people gave us in terms of ideology if we're going to be able to build strong men. We can't build strong men playing by somebody else's rules. Wow. OK. Um I don't know if anybody wants to say how heavy that was. I would like to uh, fully agree with what he just said. I think as, as black men, we really under, need to understand that. And that is the biggest part of what we're mis misunderstanding is that we don't understand the concept of what's going on. And I think that he, 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 he killed it all for that one. Thank you. I, I want to um, thank you, Mr. Mays. I, I had a, an exchange. I'm trying to go back to it. And I think it was Brother Red who brought up in the chat room, he said, Malcolm X was Malcolm Little, Red, Detroit Red, Satan in prison, ultimately becoming the great El Haj Malik El Shabazz. He was a son, a brother, a father, a husband. He was love, he was strength, he was fearless, he was understanding, he was ever evolving, he was brotherhood, he was manhood. Dr. Stitt, you left, wow. out, one important, you left out one important name. After El Haj Malik El Shabazz, he became Omar Wali. 
you got to look at that part because again he when you look at it historically he returned back to his african roots when he took on that name Oma Wally, so he can't Dr. leave out his final name. Oh, not at all. I was just reading what Brother Red was saying, but Dr. Small, if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat box, so that's something that we can all, um, you know, have the knowledge of and, and know how, you know, what it means and what it represents as far as his, his evolution, so to speak. Right. Um, I mean, I'm sure everyone can kind of agree to the fact that, and I said this in the beginning, we all have gone through some type of evolution as adults. Um, and as young people, you're still evolving. Uh, and, and it's important for you to understand that you, your identity is going to still shape itself based off, the, based off of the relationships that you have, the interactions that you have. Um, I'm, I'm going to charge all the educators that are on this, this call to, you know, if you are in a school environment where your, your, um, your teaching staff um, may not fully represent the children who um, you're in charge of educating. I, I'm going to charge you to to kind of wake them up a little bit, shake them up, tell them what they need to do, give them, you know, kind of be the mentor, take them under your wing, because we are losing um, many of our children, and it's for very all the reasons that have been identified here. Um, and if if anybody you know wants to agree or disagree, please feel free to jump in and do so. But um. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. This is Shawnee. Hey, Shawnee. It's one of my students, <laughs> um, my former students. Hello, everyone. Oh, um, you just you just set away my comment, right? So you know, I'm a I'm an educator, and I recently was um brought into an IEP meeting, and I was almost like coached into um saying what wasn't true about the children that we serve. And it's because, you know, everybody, they, they just don't understand. You know, our, our fellow, you know, co-laborers, mm -hmm. they don't understand. And, you know, mm -hmm. my issue, you know, I had to bring it up to my principal, of course, on the side, was that, you know, like, I'm all for the teachers' fellows. I'm all for these beautiful programs. I'm all for these amazing opportunities for people to educate themselves and transition into you know um a different career path or what have you but these people don't understand our kids they don't understand our background they don't understand our culture and i feel like the coin is always going to override the culture because you can go you you know you go into these programs for two years you commit to two years in the urban school and then you can bounce and so like there's no connection there's no commitment to our schools and every now and then i find myself flexing because you know, I know what it was to have teachers that actually care and then to see how teachers, like you signed up for this and you ready to sign off that this kid is, you know, emotionally disturbed or, you know, this kid now is ADHD. So let's go ahead and coach these parents into getting on this IEP going and then we can we can push in there also that, you know, they can sign up for disability and all of this stuff. And then it's like a continued cycle of this, um, sort of incompetence that our children are attached to. So, you know, I just wanted to put that out there that I'm, I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part and making sure the people who hear me, if you, you know, like I, I watch this lady over the phone and then, you know, everything is remote now. So, you know, like having these IP meetings over the phone and she's like, you know what, is she having tantrums? And I'm like, what a tantrum? Like, Give me another term, because if you're saying tantrum, then no, if that's rolling on the floor, that's crying, that's kicking, that's screaming, no. Because he's six, will he cry in school? Absolutely. That is not a tantrum, though, man. And so, you know, it got quiet, and you know, I wasn't invited to the next one, of course, but, you know, I got a call on the back end, and they were very impressed with my own passion and my own willingness to you know, speak up for this kid. So, you know, like, I feel like I'm taking a stand and making sure that my voice is heard because I feel like we need to advocate for our children because, you know, some, not all, but most don't have this connection that we need. And I knew I had when I was growing up. Shout out to uh, Brother Fatah and uh, Stick. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. I, I'm sorry, but um, it's a. It, I appreciate you so much. And believe it or not, um, there are a couple of our um, 
our children that are on this call who are now professionals in the education system. And um, so Brother Patai, you know, our work has been, it, it, it's been done and it's gonna continue. Um, but I wanna jump in real quick because um, if I'm saying it right, Job Anders Anderson, Anderson said, I always talk to my teacher, but they don't listen to me. And I mean, I could go, I'm sure I could say a whole lot about that. But um, if there's anyone who wants to respond to that or, you know, kind of uh, give Anderson a, a couple of words of wisdom, you know, please feel free to do so. And is it, I'm sorry, is it Anderson or is it Job? Please forgive me. You could put it in the chat. It's fine. Okay. Brother, any of, any of my speakers want to want to address yeah, that? I definitely want to address. Hold 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 on, Mr. Mays. Go ahead, Brother Pata. Brother Anderson, I appreciate your your comment in the chat. Um, oftentimes, the students who are the most vulnerable in the schools are the, the least heard, and so there is definitely a necessity for a community to be supportive so that you're able to have these conversations uh, that sometimes uh, adults to adult would best be able to influence. You know, um, you as a student cultivating your voice and being able to say ouch when it hurts is all justifiable and being able to develop your voice to be able to speak truth to power is essential. Yet to, to really be able to move the needle is going to be necessary for an, an advocate, an adult, a, a, a community member, a dog, you know, <laughs> anyway. a community member to be able to come through and uh, be able to represent your voice. Uh, that That's extremely important, you know, of the person who is able to come and sometimes even have a family because, uh, Let's be real. Sometimes they don't feel that there is there are any advocates. That's why they're able to get away with it. You know, there's been some experiences where, and I see some of the members from the St. Hofer Passages Program, Philly, Dr. Forster, I see you. We, we had individuals who were in the school to be able to represent and advocate for the young men in, in that way. And when they saw three to four strong brothers coming to represent a young man that they didn't think had any connections, it changed the whole dynamic of the conversation. And from that day forward, that student would never have those issues and problems anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a checks and balance kind of a relationship and a, 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 an adult advocate is extremely necessary. You, you got it. Uh, I, I mean, I'm shaking my head because we all know that the power, the presence brings so much power. Um, I don't, I know we're going over time a little bit, but there is a request to speak from Miss, Mr. from Brother Zatiti Moody, if I'm saying it correctly. Um, if I'm saying it incorrectly, please forgive me. But um, feel free to, to share what it was that you wanted to share with, with the rest of us. Drop your gem. Uh, uh, I just wanted to, to chime in real quick on two things real quick. Um, being in the special education um, side of things, uh, I think the young lady spoke on um, limiting herself or she was coached into saying certain things. Um, we are, as, as, as being in that, in that field, of course, you are coached to say certain things, but you have to understand the potential of your kids. If your kids have the potential of doing certain things, you need to speak on those things because that's what limits our kids because we are, we are coached into it. They don't want, I'm not going to say they don't want to see the, they don't want to see the potential in them, but if they're not given the chance, they are held back. And if they're not, if they're held back, they are limited, and we have to see the potential in them. So I would never say, you know, don't say what you what you feel. If that kid is being successful in that classroom and just that certain subject, express being, you know, uh, successful in that certain subject because that kid needs that 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 shine. Like he needs to, they need to see that he's a capable of doing something. You are limiting that child, and I think it's frustrating and it's and it's kind of irritating when you hear certain things because people are telling like. We don't want to see certain kids successful. There was a news. There was a news um, article the other day. Even a newscast even said it. Whereas though they were talking about certain like brown and black kids, uh, special education, certain things that kids of those of those genders and that and that and that and that description fit for summer school. 
Well, what about the other kids that need to fit for summer school as well? But they are subjecting and they're limiting and saying, like, these kids need help. But what about the other kids that need help? But they're not focusing on the other kids because they're focusing on a certain population. And the other thing I would say is as far as challenging, challenging your students, if you are a teacher, if you are an advocate, challenge your students to, to do more. Like, these kids need that. They want it. If you're not giving it to them, they're not going to take it. They're not going to accept it because they're going to say, we're only subject to what you give us. But if you hold back and say, well, this is what we want you to have, that's all they're going to accept. If you challenge them more, and, I, and, and, I'm only, and I'm only saying that because of the personal experience with my son being in a, in a certain school, he was limited. And I had to challenge his teacher because she didn't want certain things to happen. And, I, and I'm only saying that, and I, I don't want to give a brief, a, a, a long story, but a short story is she was talking about Harriet Tubman. And when I asked him, can he do somebody else? She said, well, we're going to focus on a, a person that uh, contributed to liberty, uh, freedom, and civil rights. It's not just about Harriet Tubman doing civil rights, liberty, and freedom. It was more to it. But she didn't want she didn't want to challenge my son. And when I challenged her authority, she got upset about it. And all I'm saying to you is you have to challenge your teachers. They're limiting certain populations. And when you limit certain populations, that's what we become content to. So we have to we have to challenge our kids. We have to challenge them and know that what you do, as long as you do more, you're gonna be you're gonna be more successful. When you're content, you're gonna be happy with what you have. So you have to you have to want more. You have to experience more. Do more. Wow. Well, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mays. I mean, I, I guess it's a, a. I'm sure it's plenty of parents on the line who um, can agree and attest to the fact that our children um, are facing you know these situations in the classroom. Um, but as as Brother Bata also said, showing up, being present um, for our kids as much as we possibly can. Um, that is extremely important, and and I I don't want to um to wrap things up before we get a chance. And how many people are able to give a couple of more minutes? If you're able to stay on, and and have a couple of more minutes to continue the conversation, um, I wanted to hear from um, Mr. Moody because he has something he wanted to say. And um, is that Mr. May? That's I'm here. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. How are you doing, Dr. Stitt? I want to thank you guys for inviting me to this uh, platform. I have my son on as well, uh, Dr. Smalls. Thank you very much. We work together with the OSG, and I always uh, learn when, when he's speaking. Uh, brother, uh, brother, uh, I, I forget his name, Brother Kamau, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. Brother Kamau uh -huh. is very strong. I, I really learned a lot from him. Uh, my name is Atidi Moody. I am a principal in Patterson, New Jersey. I actually have my father on the line, Alonzo Moody, um, who my school is named after, Alonzo Tambor Moody Academy here in Patterson, New Jersey. Respect and we to the work, elders. Respect absolutely. To the elders here. <laughs> we work with the alternative population here in Patterson. I've worked here um, uh, with the alternative population for about 22 years. So I love some of the conversation that I'm hearing in uh, what, what, what Brother Kamau told uh, the young lady or who asked the question about the teachers or who do not want to listen, who don't listen to um, their way. Um, that's a terrible thing. And, and from what I heard from the sisters who had the troubles with the child study team and the special ed uh, students, what, what happens is we're, we're in a, a school culture where the, they dominate, that they're the dominant force of what happens in schools. When we become leaders of schools and, and informal leaders, like the brother who spoke, who's also the special ed teacher, we have a position of power in, in just that. We have an ability to connect and communicate with our uh, young people. We have to encourage them and teach them uh, how to advocate for themselves. We ultimately all work for the students. And no matter what teacher is ignorant and, uh, uh, and has some racist ways about them, the reality is we're all working for our student population and our families. And we have to uh, uh, en encourage them and teach them and have them become the strongest advocates. Because when they speak up, 
Um, I mean, we speak as well. When I when a parent comes into my office, I'm on their side for for the most part. I'm I'm representing them, even against the district or or whoever else. I want to empower them with the information to make the best decisions possible for 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 the students. And doing this from a, a, a an educating from a cultural perspective is just it, it, it should come natural to us. And I say should, and it's really based upon how we were brought up and how we were taught, right? Um, you can't distinguish, you can't say this is an education. Uh, if we're African Americans, I'm gonna give it from an African American standpoint. I'm gonna hold the leadership mantle to ensure that my teachers are treating my students with respect. We're gonna create a culture by hiring, um, and that becomes a process over time because sometimes we inherit our staffs, but we have to hire people who have the same uh, uh, ideology as us. And when we start developing that culture within our school, teachers like that start to become the outcasts. I don't have to check any teacher that's not doing right by our students, no matter what uh, type of student it is. Our staff, our culture confronts them. Our students have the ability to confront teachers and me as well as the principal and the superintendent. Nobody is above confrontation. We have to start changing the mindset and having young, uh, young people understanding their true purpose. We talked about it briefly here and I loved how we jumped on that conversation initially. What is our purpose? I was taught at a very young age that our purpose is to create a world better than the one that we inherited. Mm. So we were all born into this world how are we making it better and our little slice of life when our little piece of whatever school you're in whatever neighborhood you're in how do you make life better for people around you that is everyone's goal and everyone's mission and that's what you have to fulfill if you're being destructive and you're tearing the neighborhood up as a community we have to fight those forces together we must all come together as one uh, to do what's best for our community. The power of the whole is much power than, the, than, than any one individual. So I wanted to just touch on that individual who talked about that. I know that has to be a tough place to be in when you have enough, uh, individuals who don't really care 100% about our students and they're not in the best interest of our students. We have to create a culture from within. If you got one or two, three people, one of the things that I, I would recommend is that um, there is a missing piece in school. Naturally, there are teachers who come to school and they want a particular thing. They have a lesson that they set and their goal is to teach that lesson and go home. We have a group of people that we started incorporating into, us, into the schools who, are, who this is their job to be the liaison or the bridge between what that teacher wants and what the actual students come to school for. Because we all know that a lot of students don't come uh, with the right mindset and they don't really appreciate uh, education as they should. So we have to have that group or a core group of people who act as the liaison, who understand exactly what the kids want, but also understand what, what the teachers want in administration and, and what we're, what's our true purpose for being in school. But people have to learn to bridge that gap, but we have to have conversations and through some real confrontation. Now, confrontation does not have to be negative. When people hear that, confrontation can be viewed as positive and because it's needed to change. We will all uh, uh, remain the same. Uh, uh, as there's a quote that I use, um, uh, the pain of change will remain until the pain of change becomes more hurtful than the pain to remain the same. So it, it, we, it, gotta, it has to hurt us to be in the position we've been in for, for hundreds of years. We have to feel hurt by that. But that hurt must feel, it be, it must, the, the, the pain to change must be less hurtful than the pain to remain the same. So remaining the same, we're, we're dying out here. So it's time, no other time than now, to make this, the, the, the moves that we need to make to, 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 to challenge the system, to change the system. To I love what the sister said. She came up under you guys. She was one of your former students, and now she's the teacher. If we're not in it for that reason, if we can't all uh, put our hands on folks that we, if we've been in the business 20 years, I can put my hands on 10 people that I've made principals. I can put my hands on hundreds of people that I've made um, teachers at some point or some, some part be, had, had a part in them becoming uh, educators in the system. That is our role when we get into these positions. So, um, you know, it's the each one teach one type of effect, but we have to begin to start looking at this uh, deeper. What is our legacy? And, and, I, and I'm proud to say, and I don't want to keep 
talking that I have my father on, Mr. Alonzo Moody, who our school was just recently named after. Uh, he actually helped to create the school over 20 years ago, and he was a board member in, in the town, and now the school is actually named after him, the Alonzo Tambor Moody Academy. So I just wanted to offer that. Thank you very much, Dr. Smalls, for even uh, inviting me, and I, and I love the conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. I got a whole, you know, you said you're in Patterson, Mr. Moody? Yes, Patterson, I am. New Jersey. So this is, um, again, these conversations, uh, they, they tend to be had in smaller circles, and I'm so thankful that we had an opportunity to, to get all of the smaller circles and put them all together so that we could reach further than we have um, in the past. This is a critical time, and I know there is um, there's a, a few discussions that are going on in the chat room. I've been trying to keep up with it, but forgive me. Um, a couple of things that stood out, and, and again, I'm not sure if everyone got the same thing, but um, Randy said, change the narrative. I got cultivate your voice. Um, manhood, you must move with caution. Uh, cold switch, not soul switch. Um, and, and most profoundly, Dr. Small said that the system isn't broken. It's doing what it was supposed to do. It was meant to destroy our children. I mean, there were so many gems that came out of this conversation. And, um, you know, speaking to the and having conversation with the speakers who um, shared their valuable time and their, their um, experience and wisdom, um, we talked about continuing this conversation. So the goal is to at least have a, a, a part two. Um, because we really didn't get into the community aspect. To, we, we touched on it, but I wanted to go a little bit deeper. And, you know, going in an hour and 10 minutes, we could do this all day. Real educators, we, we get down and we could do this for a long time. This is our conversation and this is why, how we work. So I wanted to, um, to share with everyone a couple of things. First off, if you didn't register, um, if you didn't fill out the registration form when you signed up through Eventbrite, um, please send me your email, email me at, uh, I put it in the chat box, but I'll do it again. L-A-S-H-A-U-7-3 at gmail.com. And I will um, send you a registration form if you, you know, um, so that I can have it for my records and also a survey form. So you could give us some feedback. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that came out of here. We had a lot of powerful people um, that were not necessarily guest speakers, but were just present. And that is so extremely important. Our village showed up today. Um, and I, believe it or not, I'm overwhelmed. The spirit of my mother is sitting right here with me. And I know for sure that she is pleased. And so all of our ancestors are pleased. And I bring that to you um, from a, a humble place. Um, I am a, a, a product of an educator. I am um, uh, just overwhelmed with, with the work that our young educators are continuing to do. And I proudly pass the baton on to them um, because the work continues. We know that our uh, black and brown children are not being taken care of the way that they need to be taken care of. And I say that in a, from a motherly perspective they're not being taken care of in the classrooms. Um, their spirits are not being fed. Their, their emotional um, balance, they're emotionally imbalanced right now. Um, and so I, I, I continue to you know, plead to you all, please continue to do the work that you're doing. Um, and I have a tentative date, uh, and I will put that out there. So that's why I would like for everyone to please send me your, um, your email addresses. Uh, August 6th, is a tentative date where we can continue this conversation. I would like to um, stress the fact that mo all of us are trained in culturally responsive teaching and learning. And that is something that is extremely relevant in the educational system right now. So um, I, please join us uh, for our next conversation. We will put, I'll put all the information out. Thank you, um, Mr. Saunders, I appreciate you. And, and for everyone who, um, who showed up, Thank you for your presence. Um, Brother Bata, I'm going to put him on the spot because he is, and I told him this years ago, and I'll bring it up. He, to me, he is so prophetic that he drops gems on a regular basis. His, the words that he uses to just soothe our soul 
and to reassure us that, um, you know, we are doing the, the work that we need to do. I just wanted to know um, if you could close us out. And, um, and I say that in a, in a sense where we always um, welcome the ancestors and we also um, close out and make sure that we're all doing this in, in the right way. And we, we, we have our, um, our armor and so that we're ready to continue to do the work. So Brother Pata, if you wouldn't mind um, taking us out, I would appreciate it. Wait, you're muted, you're muted. Thank you, Dr. Stitt, for hosting us and facilitating a powerful conversation. The charge is for us for the next time to ensure that some uh, pre-work is done by some of the young people so that their voices can be present for the conversation because it's critical for us to be able to hear them. And uh, in closing, I'm pleased and I recognize that uh, the elders on the phone who are showing up, uh, those who are in the middle seasons of our lives are here. We have young facilitators and educators that are here. And then we also had the youth. So what we did today was monumental because a lot of times we are just kind of caught in within our own age generation gap. And this conversation that's necessary is essential for us to be able to establish what 21st century uh, black and brown manhood looks like. And it's marrying from the Sankofa principle of retrieving from the past as we're moving forward, you know, taking from the genius and the brilliance and the excellence that represents our uh, educational traditions, our cultural traditions, and all those that represent every, any area in life. And I just would like to close out with the charge uh, that List Develop Medicine gave us years ago that has been a mantra for the work that I've done and the communities that have been anchored within the, the, the work of Know Thyself. And uh, if everybody would repeat after me, sharpen your eyes. Sharpen your eyes. Sharpen your eyes. Tune your ears. Tune, Tune your, your ears. ears. So you know what you see. So, so you, you know what you see. see. Understand what you hear. Understand, Understand what you hear. Yeah. Minute by minute. Minute, minute by, by minute. minute. Hour by hour. Hour, hour, by by hour. hour by hour. As we know our story. As we, as we know, know our, our story. story. <laughs> we know our power. We know our power. I say, thank you so much. I say. Thank you so much. Um, if there's anyone who wanted to uh, continue, if you can stay on, fine. If not, I, I bid you all peace and um, healthy, healthy, a healthy experience. Stay balanced and um, stay spiritually connected as much as you can for our young people. I appreciate you all and um, look forward to the next one. I say. Thank you, Jalil. Nubia messages, I appreciate you. Thank you, Shawnee. Dr. Thomas, I'm thankful that Dr. Small made the connection. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. I am so happy to be here and I'm really uh, enjoying this conversation and I, and I feel so enlightened and ready for action. And I, I just want to thank you all for all of your input and, and Dr. Small all the time. I'm always learning every day. I love it. I, I just want to, I want to say hello to Moody Sr. Uh, I've heard so much about you and it's a pleasure to, to meet you, uh, even though it's virtually, but uh, I, I just heard so many great things about you, Moody Sr. Uh, and your son is just incredible. I love that guy. Thank you to the elders, please. You're on mute, uh, Brother Senior Moody. You're on mute. Uh, Help him out, Moody. Dad, you're on mute. I see him. You gotta hit your button and unmute it. I guess the host can unmute him. I'm trying to, but it's, it's not letting me.
Okay, I'm going to leave you all, but it was a pleasure to be in this meeting. Thank you, and, Mr. Uh, Ford. I will continue to be a special educator for however long I can do that. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your devotion. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yo, know, Brother Pata, it was so good to hear Brother uh, Lissabelle's words. I mean, that, that poem is that poem is just so incredible. I've always, always, always loved that poem. I remember uh, going to the first row lectures, and they'd always open and close with that poem. Uh, so thanks for bringing, bringing those is, memories back. Uh, absolutely. We, we drank from that same fountain. So, yeah, definitely. And, and the, words came, the, the words came back to me just like a hip-hop song. It's like, I don't even know. I still remember <laughs> the words. Oh, wow. Thank you, Angelica, for being present. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate you. I'd Getting a lot of good feedback. Out. You're welcome. Shouting out to my elders and my teachers. First, I have my mom on call today. Thank you, Dawn Ms. Patterson. Dawn Patterson. Oh, wow. Then, then we have <laughs> one of my primary <laughs> teachers in African studies, Dr. Barbara Ann Glover, is in the building. The in the building. building. I got my cousin, Gail, who's present on the line. Thank you. And then you. we want to shout out all of those who were... Uh, who sat in our classes and taught us the craft of teaching. Definitely the Wigfall twins. Yes, they had indeed. Me. Uh, we have uh, Brother Jalil Jordan, who's the St. Cole for Passages in Philadelphia. Brother Red, Uwak and Akko Ben. Um, got Dr. Kerry Foster, I saw him on the line. How about that? Got my nephew, Jalil Shabazz, shouting out him, representing Akko Ben Enterprise. And sure. has gone through those rites of passages. Got Brother Kojo, got Elder Nubian Messenger, uh, and Wata Nubian on the line. So these are all teachers, young and old teachers, who have helped to shape and craft uh, this particular mission that we're on. So and how about, I, I'm glad you brought up uh, Brother Kojo, uh, Brother Vatan. I didn't, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I got to say this. So uh, Brother Kojo, um, taught my oldest son. I'm going to date him real quick. That's right. Peace, brother. Thank you for being here. It's absolutely my pleasure. And, and, and just anything that you were doing, anything my brother is doing, I'm right there with you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I have to shout out um, uh, Frank Petanella because he definitely... Um, not only came in in a clutch, but he was, he wanted to be present. He wanted to share. He wanted to just give whatever insight he could. Um, and he does a lot of work with the ACLU down here in Baltimore County. And um, I, I, I did a little bit of work with him um, in regards to the blueprint and the Corwin commission, um, the Corwin bill that was, that we were trying to get passed. Um, and so his presence is, is necessary because he speaks to another aspect of the community and how we we need to be involved um not just on our you know local levels but on a, a statewide level um you know and nationally so i thank you so much frank for being here i really appreciate it thanks thanks for having me i really appreciated what everyone had to share it's always just helpful to hear everyone's perspective and and just gain um, as as i continue the work um i just wanted to say that um, I, I, I do um, join a lot of conversations around town and statewide on the issue of anti-racism in schools and culturally responsive pedagogy and so on, um, where I do see um, the big gap, the big need is that this message isn't permeating into, into uh, the spaces where decisions are made. Um, a lot of times people show up at school board meetings, um, they'll say these things, um, but then perhaps there's, there's not enough support or a structure um, to continue the work. Um, there's a group here called Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle. They are, um, I, I would um, definitely get connected with them if you're in the area. Um, 
they're, they're really great. Um, they proposed the amendment to the blueprint bill. This is a sweeping right um, education reform bill at the state level. Has a lot of great things in it, but glaringly absent is um, the anti-racism uh, framework in the bill. And this, this amendment was proposed. Um, we supported it. We were going around talking to legislators. Um, when the conversation or the, the amendment was introduced in committee, just very little conversation on it at all. Um, there's a couple legislators that spoke up and said, oh, that sounds interesting. Let's, I, I wanna hear more about that. Um, but most people were silent and the leadership shut it down immediately and they just rammed the bill through. Um, and now the bill has that big gaping hole in it. So I'd be happy to, um, you know, just, just be involved in any conversation in terms of, you know, how do we, how do we make sure that there is institutional power behind these kinds of tasks? And I'm willing to raise money. I'm willing to pull resources from the ACLU, um, make that happen. So thanks again, and I'm always available. I gotta jump on another call. It's okay. Thank you so much. I, I, I'll, you know, we'll have, we'll continue our conversation because um, this has to happen again. Um, who, Brother Jalil, thank you. We appreciate your time and your energy also. Um, we have a, 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 I guess this is a charge. Can we get a mentorship going from this network, please? I love education and I'm inspired by what I have heard today. I'm currently completing my second master's whoop, whoop, and would appreciate some guidance. That is from one of my twin babies, um, LaShawn Wigfall. And um, is there anyone who is willing to be a part of uh, mentorship to you know, continue this work as we get ready for part two? I see you, Brother Pata. Always on the scene. Is that a hand raised, uh, Dr. Small? Are you signing up for the... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always at your service, Dr. Stitt. I appreciate that. All right, so we have two. Anybody else? Who else? I see you, Mr. Moody. All right, so we have... Who else? Thank you, Dr. Thomas. I see you. Anybody else? All right, so I think we need to... Um, um, Mr. Moody, if you could send me your email or you could pass it on to um, Dr. Small, we can continue this conversation um, and, and plan for the next, the next couple of um, uh, events that I would like to have. I'll definitely do that. I'll send it out in the, in the chat to everybody and I look forward to it. I love to talk to uh, the young minds, uh, not really young minds, but folks who are, are new up and coming in, in, in the field to navigate their way through the, uh, the, the time bombs throughout our field uh, so that they don't get blown up, so that they can hopefully make it to the point to where we're running uh, uh, the district and, and we're making those type of decisions uh, for, for our uh, young people. Absolutely. Well, um, one of the topics that I would like to cover later on um, as we continue is um, the curriculum that is currently in the school system and how we need to reshape that. Um, we, we had some freedom with UOC, um, and I'm sure there are plenty of other schools where, um, you know, we took the, the liberty, because it is our liberty, uh, we took the liberty to kind of revamp and redesign what we knew our young men needed. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, continue that conversation just to see how this, it can be implemented in other schools. Um, I, I was in New York, I'm not in New York anymore, I'm actually in Baltimore. And, um, you know, the powers that be will continue to buck uh, what we know as um, being necessary for our kids. Um, so I just wanna, uh, you know, see if that was a possibility to continue this conversation. Ours was um, geared towards um, more Afrocentric and more family oriented, um, but it was definitely a culture, cultural based um, curriculum. And I just want to um, continue to do that and, and pass the baton on to those. Now, also, Go ahead, I also remind them, even, even where it's not in the curriculum, it's our responsibility to ensure that it's there. Uh, and for everybody on the line, I always tell people, 
Um, leadership is not a position. Leadership is a behavior. So each of us, what, regardless of our position and place and space in life, has the opportunity to step up and lead. Um, again, I'm in my, I just closed out my eighth year in a school and every one of those eight years, and Dr. Thomas can tell you, we can ensure that, that we included our history in the curriculum, even when it wasn't available, we created a curriculum uh, to run parallel um, to the curriculum that was given us um, because we know it's that important. Um, and so at the end of the day, we, we need courageous leadership and we gotta understand that even, you know, we can't wait for the school system to be what it needs to be. We gotta ensure that it, it's what it needs to be um, until it becomes what it needs to be. Right, and so each of us uh, need to, to to embody that. We got to understand that what our children uh, really need is really a conspiracy of love. They need a lot of hugs and things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. when when you're able to ensure uh, that children know that they're loved, I always like to kind of go back to Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. A lot of our children really feel invisible, and it's up to us to to make them not invisible, to let them know that we see you, we hear you, we, we're going to hold you, we're going to love you, and in doing so. We're gonna ensure that your roots are strong because we're gonna nourish those roots um, regardless of whether the, the school itself or the district itself uh, is vested in doing so. And so again, we, we, we will be, we're, we're ultimately, we, we don't have a right to even speak or, or even call ourselves doctors or anything like that if we're not taking up that responsibility. No one's gonna give us permission. You gotta give yourself permission. You got to take the, be courageous and say, you know what, regardless of whether anyone else is doing it, I'm going to do it. Regardless of whether the district is doing it, I'm going to do it. Regardless of whether someone gave me the permission or the means to do it, I'm going to do it. And when we have enough people stepping up and being courageous and not looking for someone else to provide them the solution and provide them the permission, that's when change will happen. Mm-hmm. 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 I got a, a request. This is um, somebody offline asking me um, to request for mentorship programming with the leaders and the community members. And I think I'm not sure if um, if she heard it, but that's that was that's the next call. Thank you for the reminder um, to Angelica. I'm not sure if she's still here. Um, so I'm going to say it one more time. If we are waiting for our enemies to give us permission to do what we know we need to do, then you're a damn fool. Right. <laughs> we we cannot wait for the pe the same people that don't want to see our children succeed. We can't continue to wait for permission from them and wait for it to be okay with them. Like they're not vested in our children succeeding because they're not vested in having our children compete against their children for livelihood. You got to understand that. And you got to be clear on that. So you got to put your like like Booker T. Washington said, put your bucket down where you're at and get busy. Mm. 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 Great, great point, uh, Dr. Smalls. I really appreciate it when you when you speak. I just wanted to uh, announce one of uh, the brothers I, I invited to the call. I have uh, one of my, uh, we started an organization in our town called the Brothers Organization. It stands for Brothers Reaching Out to Help Everyone Rebuild Self. Uh, I got uh, Principal Ken McDaniel on the line as well. If you just wanted to introduce yourself, Ken, I appreciate it. You're in. Am I in? Hello? Yeah, Hello? Dr. Oh, hi. Greetings. Greetings to you, my son. Oh, <laughs> my son, my heart. <laughs> what is being said here? I talked about the curriculum. And I thank you very much, Dr. Smalls, for making that point. As my, my mentor, Dr. John Henry Clark, said, get in the classroom and close the door and teach. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the bottom line. And key here is to have courage. Everybody is not going to get tenure, but that's okay because there's another job out there. But you get in that classroom and you close the door. If you're in science, then you talk about the black scientists. Math, you talk about them black mathematicians. That's and funny. that's how you get in there. That's how our parents' parents taught us. And then all this other stuff, pedagogy, fine. Use the terms, but get in the classroom and close the door. Another piece is right now, those of us, Dawn, you and I know, what happened during the 60s when we Ungawa, Black Power, we rioted, right? We got all kinds of programs after that. It lasts for about 10 years and then they closed the doors. Now, we're at the same point now. 
I have in my head and no, no, the people have been sending me notices that NYU is opening up a program for young people who are interested in going into medicine. That's what we're talking about now. Let us get into these programs. Um, Goldman Sachs is now looking for your people, the melanated people. They want to bring them into uh, working with Goldman Sachs. So we're talking about now moving the agenda. We learned from the 60s that the programs will be closed. And I'm looking at my timeline. We're talking about probably in another seven years. So let us get in these programs and do what we have to do and don't keep our mouth closed about it. So I will pass the information to my son, Dawn's son, <laughs> to uh, Patah. And our son, our, our son. son right? And get him the program. And my husband here, he's the one that got us all started with this in the 1960s, <laughs> with the Ungawa Black Power, okay, in 1964 and so forth. But I will pass that information to Patah and you can send it out to people, young people coming to the table. They're looking for black folks coming from Howard or Hampton or any of the black schools or Cooney. They're looking for people right now and it's supposed to be quiet, but I'll send it to you. Okay, that's my piece. The curriculum. Sister Barbara, Sister thank Barbara, you. I just wanna thank you for raising uh, the, the name of our good brother, Dr. John Henry Clark. Oh yeah, absolutely. He was also uh, one of my teachers when I was in I just came out of fifth grade when I first took my trip to Africa with Dr. Clark, Dr. Scobie, Dr. Ben, uh, Dr. Jeffries. Uh, and I actually, my and first trip to Africa, and my dad, Professor James Small. Uh, and so I actually went to my first trip to Africa. I was with Dr. Clark's son, Sony. Mm -hmm. That was me, Sony, and uh, Dr. Jeffries' nephew, Hassan, who's now a professor. Um, so thanks for raising that name. I, Dr. Clark was just such an, not just an amazing historian, but he was an amazing storyteller. Absolutely. He, story. He, story. Yes. When, Absolutely. when he spoke, he, he had the power to tell a story and that, that's what really brought it alive. And Dr. Clark, I remember spending time at, in his home as a yeah. child, mm -hmm. um, right in Harlem. And again, I just appreciate, you know, raising his name because at the end of the day, we stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us and you won't know where you're going and you won't be able to definitely move into the future unless you understand the shoulders that you stand on. So we see our young people out here protesting and things, but it's up to us to have them understand we're appreciative and we, we want, we're going to hold you up and make you and protect you and take care of you. But you also got to be clear that it's a, a passing of the baton. The baton is being passed uh, to these young folks who continue the work that, that, that's been done. It's not a new work. It's no. just a continuation. It's just a baton Continuing. passing. Uh, and so we have yeah. to make sure that we're bringing historical perspective to the young folks out here in the fight, but also let them, have them understand that the fight has to be fought on multiple fronts. It has to be fought in the street, but then it's our responsibility, those of us who are educated and in our different positions, to take the fight to the legislative, to take the fight to the judiciary, yeah. to take the fight to uh, the systems that we're all a part of and have the capacity and the ability to change because we already are in those doors, right? And so we got to make sure uh, that our young folks understand that we're in it together. We may not be out in the street at the same time, but we did that, right? Uh, we're in the boardrooms and we're in the policy rooms and we're in the legislatures and we're in the, in the voting uh, booths and things. And so they have to understand that um, this is a multifaceted fight uh, and they have to also have historical uh, uh, perspective. So again, thank you for calling out the name of our great brother, Dr. Clark. Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben, if you're gonna talk about uh, what is it? Uh, what is it? We say Egypt, but he would call it. Damn it, damn it. Kemet, right? They would call it Kemet. You know, when you have those foundations, and I'm just so proud of young people that I see that I call them the warriors in the classroom. Yes. These sisters and brothers are in these classrooms, and they are teaching. All right, they're teaching methods. They're teaching skills, the skill to think. And I'm glad um, a Patah mentioned that stuff to think and use your ears. You know, and the Nation of Islam teach you to watch as people walk in and use your eyes to watch and see how people are moving their agenda and sending out clues. All of these things toughen and strengthen our young people. So let's not put these things on the side. You know, these people left this information for us to carry further. So I thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, um, Brother Raymond. Welcome. We just wanted to... Um,
shout you out for joining us. We appreciate you. Thank you. I have um, uh, Sister Glover, I know you mentioned um, some uh, programs coming down the pike. I have uh, Dr. Um, Rolanda Hobson Carter on. Um, she's in the call as well. And um, I think this the information would be very helpful to her with her young people. Mm -hmm. um, and what she's, I'm still admitting people, I'm sorry. Um, and the work that she's doing with our young people from a, a, a counseling perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm looking forward to, to her having that information and making that connection for our young people. Dr. Stitt, if I could, I just want to, I mean, I'm just sitting here listening to the conversation. I just want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Dr. Patterson and, 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 and Dr. Glover and, and her husband. Uh, as I'm just uh, listening to the, the fruit that came out of them and uh, and Brother Kamau and, and then the sister that you had on that, that, that came from, uh, uh, that was a student of yours, is just a fruit to their labor and, and what they instilled at the time where they, when, when it wasn't popular to uh, so-called be black. And, and it wasn't about being popular, it's about being strong and standing up for what's right at that time and educating and taking the time out to teach uh, uh, your, the children that were around you and, and to see that come to fruition. I just give uh, honor and praise to, to the others again. As you all know, uh, we, we, we don't start any meeting. We don't do anything without actually getting permission from my elders to move on who, who laid the way and paved the way. I just want to give a shout out to, 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 uh, to those seasoned veterans and let you know we're, we're working in, and we're, we're working on, on your shoulders, on your backs to continue to, to create a legacy and make sure that the work that you did did not go in vain. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Doctoral candidate uh, Sharice Wigfall, uh, Dr. Thomas, thank you for shouting her out. She was one of my babies um, when she was in, in school. And um, when I see her and her, her sister, her twins, um, and they are just two examples of the work that we have done and that continues to, to um, happen. But um, to see how they have evolved into the educators that they are is just, it's humbling. Um, and you know that when you see, and I'm sure everybody could attest to this, when you see that, um, you see it happening, it's just, you know that you're in the right place and you know that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. So I just had to, I had to add that one in. I'm sorry. Thank you for not blowing us up. <laughs> <laughs> They're always present. Um, they always, you know, whenever I call, they're always willing and, and um, you know, just wanting to be a part of, and, and I appreciate that. So my village, um, I, I lean on them. I lean on my village, and I'm not just saying for the elders, um, but I mean all that encompass my village. So, um, you know, as you said, this is, this is very important to see the, young, the younger generation um, continuing to do the work, and, and I have passed the baton on. I, I'm, I'm in another... Uh, season but i have passed my baton on so thank you so i think i, I think it would be great if we can hear from those who have received the baton and get a perspective on what they're seeing uh closer to the generation that they're impacting you know right now they're the prime time players in the game you know uh before we do that i, I want to acknowledge brother baraka who just came in to the virtual building welcome uh, brother baraka does great work, specialists centered around the rites of passage work, right? And so uh, we have some 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 young warriors on the phone from the Wigfall twins to Brother Shabazz is on the phone, Brother Red. Just going to be able to ensure that you know we we created a forum specifically designed to support their next steps and being able to get an idea of being able to see what the wisdom of our journeys and also apply the genius that's coming that they they've all represented and have embraced so let's hear from some of the, some of our former students and those and and teachers because each and every one of them has really crafted and gave us and i know the wigfall sisters gave me a run for my money Ooh. put me in put me in the game <sighs> Yes, deep sigh. <laughs> Sharice is saying thank you. She's in the chat. 
All right, but so so the the forum is up for for, for the the thirty five and under. Peace, peace, brother Jalo Shabazz, going on family, truly blessed to be in the in the flex. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was just thinking about uh, everything that's being said, and uh, all the brothers talking about how the system is broke, and you know it's true. We really in a a unique time and position right now, and um, and everything that I always look to. In, all, in terms of creating uh, creating something, it's really just comes down to space for me. And I'm really like trying to think about how do we identify these spaces where we really can like grow without uh, without resistance. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Or with the least resistance. You know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, like school systems, that's cool. I love it. Yeah, and uh, I love what uh, Dr. Uh, Glover said about closing the door and teaching because that's, that's exactly what I've done as I uh, maneuver through all the different uh, spaces that I've been through. But, you know, I grew up in a, a, a unique situation where we had a school that it was, um, it was very clear what the, what the school mission was. We had a building and you can actually do what we wanted in that building without any type of uh, Eurocentric uh, oppressive force really beating down on us besides the rent needing to be due, right? <laughs> um, and so, I think, you know, just moving towards building more spaces like that, being real creative and grassroots about how we do that and really letting go of the idea that we need to attach ourselves to these larger systems always is my is my main um my main goal at this moment because um yeah, uh, it doesn't seem sustainable to, to keep on connecting ourselves uh to these larger systems like uh Dr. Glover said, they give us ten years and then uh get us out the out the budget or whatever the case so um trying to create something that's sustainable trying to create something that's truly ours i think is really the the bigger mission um i know there are institutions that that are, are like that and it's really like up to us to to really insert ourselves in those places and be pillars you know and um stay strong in it and uh i, I had this this talk with one of my mentors literally in uh in january me and my mentor was going back and forth because i i legit i said to them I was like, yo, all we need is 180 uh, days of curriculum. That's, that's all it takes to really uh, substantially uh, replace the system that's in place. Because it's, it's real lackluster, the system that's already in place. And really, if you just in, introduce 100 and, 180 days of, of what your system will look like, it, it'll automatically be better than whatever's already going on. Mm. Right? And so um, I think, you know, as a community, we could definitely come up with what those 108 days look like with math, science, culture, and the arts. Um, and, and it could be real simple. We live in a virtual reality now. And that's something that we could really do today, tomorrow, this week, next month. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's something that's really attainable in my eyesight. So I just want to, you know, do whatever I can to put my work and my intention towards creating that, that, uh, that system that replaces the system that, that we grew up in. I say. I say. Yeah. Sister Thanks, Sit, I'm gonna Dr. Sit. I'm gonna have to run. That's fine. Uh, but, I appreciate uh, you. Thank thank you so much. And whatever you need, just uh please reach out. Thank you, Brother Batah. Thank you, thank Moody. you Dr. Smith. Uh thank you, Sister Patterson and Sister Glover and Dr. Thomas. It was uh definitely a pleasure. And again, um, you know, this is not uh, a conversation. This is the work. This is us brainstorming so that when we hang up that we are able to go out and do the work. This is us, um, you know, being thought partners so that when we hang up from the call, we go out and do the work. Uh, so just making sure that it, especially the younger people in LaShawn, you don't got enough gray hair to be talking about you passing the time. Hey. <laughs> so stop it. Uh, but again, th this is great to have thought partners uh, but remembering that is it can't just be an intellectual exercise. Right. Um, intellectual exercise is nothing without action. So uh, just challenging everybody on the call to uh, get that action and be about that action um, in between our intellectual uh, conversations is making sure that we're about that action. Um, but thank you again. I love you, Malik. I, I appreciate you and thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Take Thomas. Care. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. Nice meeting everyone, and I hope to do some uh, good work with you and continue the action. Absolutely. I'll send you an email. Please do. Please. I absolutely will. Thank you for your presence. Thank you very much. Um, Sharice, there is a, an, uh, a group 
um, of educators, young educators. Can you put it in the chat box? I cannot remember the name um, that led the rally and the protests in Brooklyn from uh, DOE. Could you put it in the um, chat room in the box for me, please? Thank you, thank you, um, Mr. Forbes. I appreciate you. Sorry, I wasn't as a, that's okay. It's all right. Sometimes the quiet ones are the powerful ones. I'm a quiet one. <laughs> I try not to, I like to play the back a little bit. Um, it helps me. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes it's a give and take. I'm, 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 I voice my opinion when I need to. Thank you, Dr. Small for inviting me. I appreciate you. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to continue to work. I actually have been invited to um, participate in a forum this evening in Montgomery County um, with uh, a, a group of physicians who um, would like to be more informed in culturally responsive uh, practices so that they can um, connect and relate to the, the parents and the, the children that they are providing services to. So um, I'm going to have to make an exit and um, and end the chat in a couple of minutes. But I just want to say again, um, everyone's presence here and the presence of those ancestors that are with us, I thank you all for just guiding me and giving me the, um, the vision um, and to, to continue to do the work. I will be in contact with everybody because um, as uh, my brother Kamal Patah said, the work continues. And so we're gonna continue this work. Um, and I, I wish you all peace and blessings and safety um, in, in your journeys. And um, if there's one last word that anybody wants to share, please do so. And then I will um, close out the meeting. I, I just wanna put this out as a final charge you know, that we carry information and we carry knowledge. It's still important for us to break some of these uh, wounds and things that represent our wound narratives so that we can show up fully present and not be triggered by some of the wounds that we might see in engaging with our community members and when our, our, when our, our children start to maybe discover what our triggers may be and then they push those buttons. So I think it's really important work for communities to come together to be reflective and create a space to uh, purge, reaffirm, and be, be able to get out. And as you know that this, is, this can be draining and taxing work uh, spiritually and emotionally and mentally. And it's very important that there are uh, retreat spaces and spaces that we go to in order for us to be able to do the deeper work that allow us to be able to resonate with the, the power and the energy and the spirit that we need to come and approach the work. So I just wanted to leave with that and give a charge to everyone to continue to self-care and optimal health spiritually, mentally, physically, and emotionally. I shall. All right, all right. Peace and love, family. Peace Take care, love. everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Right, right. Thank you. Right. Thank you.